Hello. Special thanks to all of our patrons. If you want to support me in other ways, all the links are listed down below. Our story begins a decade before the Separatist Crisis, where we find a young Kali warlord by the name of Kwaman Jai Shilo, facing his largest test as a warrior. During a war led by the powerful Kali warrior, General Shalal faced the challenges of being revered as almost godlike on his homeworld. General Shalal took the people from Kali to other planets across the stars, with numerous fighting amongst wild space. Though General Shalal had a fascinating disdain for the Republic, it was grown from an unknowing perspective of the galactic superpower. Kali and the rest of Wild Space were pretty much separated from the Republic, and for a man like Quamen, he saw anything larger than him as a threat. His campaigns of war were led against a nearby planet, against the Huck. General Shalil's actions were sound, and he was able to eventually drive the Huck from their home world. When he did, he slowed down his pursuit of domination, and that's when the Republic came to Wild Space. The Republic was guided by Jedi. General Shalal didn't like the idea of the Republic or the Jedi intervening in their situation, but when the Jedi arrived, they did everything in their power to assist the situation without escalation. Had the Jedi not been there though, it's very possible and even plausible that the Republic would have escalated the situation beyond repair. The Jedi were able to make a deal between Kaylee and the Huck, which would have the Kaylee warriors return to their home world and become a part of the Republic, while also allowing the Huck to join the Republic and have full control of their own home world. As a central warlord and therefore leader of Kaylee, General Shalal would accept the offer because his people needed supplies that only a war or the Republic could generate for him. And while Shalal garnered a reputation through his war tactics and his leadership as a warlord, it was his ability to negotiate that brought his people everything they needed. This would not only change Shalal's vision of war, but it would also change his opinions about the Republic. He was a proud warrior, and reverting from war was often a challenge. For Shalal, it was an insatiable hunger that he craved, but when it came to his people, their happiness and success was his concern. With Kaylee and Huck joining the Republic, Wild Space would become part of the rest of the Republic, slowly. During this time, General Shalal would continue his reputation known as a powerful warrior, considering General Shalal was known not just by his planet, by the ones around him as a powerful warrior. Shalal knew that the best way to continue working on his craft would become a gladiator. While yes, a gladiator, he was still a leader, and he enjoyed the art of combat. As a man, it allowed him to craft his skills around his style, and even harden himself as a true warrior. This would continue for two decades. During this time, General Shalal saw many reasons to actually respect the Republic, and even more so, the Jedi. His respect for the Jedi was outlined by their ability to help those around them, something that he as a leader understood. The desire to care for those who otherwise would be helpless without them. Though, as much as Shalal respected the Republic and the Jedi, he had no issue picking a fight or laying down the heat when he needed to. He continued to lead his world peacefully, but he never backed down from any challenge many of which would come his way because of his position as a leader of the planet and that of a gladiator. When the Clone Wars began, Shalal believed it was his duty to defend his people from the Separatists. General Shalal didn't see any reason to join the Republic until he watched what happened to Ryloth, Twidaria, and Christophsis after the first couple months of the war. Seeing the Separatists would go as far as they would to plunge worlds in the chaos. As a warlord, Shalal knew that this wouldn't stop in the Outer Rim. It would go all across the galaxy, the deep space, wild space, and even the unknown regions. It didn't really matter. Everyone was a target to the Separatists, and so after debate for several weeks, General Shalal would relinquish his control over the Kaylee and depart to the capital city of the Republic. Upon his arrival, he would be shocked, amazed to say the least. He may have come from an advanced society, but Coruscant was incredible. When Shalal arrived, he made his way over to the Republic military facility. It wasn't the smartest decision, but he was going there because he wanted to serve as a leader for the Republic, to take down the Separatists and assist the Republic and the defeat of the droid armies. When he landed, he was surrounded by dozens of clone troopers. There was a Jedi Master currently at the base. He was renovating a warehouse to train his student in, but again, she was running late. So General Skywalker came over to the landed ship and made his way through the group of clone troopers. Skywalker recognized the general from Kaylee as he told his men to stand down and allow the good general to come forward. The men around Skywalker lowered their weapons as they watched him step forward and bow respectfully to General Shalal. Some of the clones knew General Shalal because he was renowned, but someone like Anakin Skywalker highly respected him. It was because he saw his actions that General Shalal made for the betterment of his people. Anakin spoke up asking, General Shil brings you here. Master Jedi, I have come to join the Republic War effort. The Separatists must be stopped. I love your eagerness, General. 
but you should have called first. Next time I'll be sure to dispense with the pleasantries. Come with me, General. I'm training my student. But afterwards, I'll point you in the best direction. General Shalal followed Anakin to the warehouse, where they found Ahsoka. Anakin was telling General Shalal about how he was training his student, to which Shalal found an immediate liking for Skywalker. The way that Skywalker, as a Jedi, understood the cost of war was fascinating. Shalal could also tell that Anakin was young, but he was very genuinely surprised to see such a young Jedi have an intense study on a warlord, especially one that hadn't been a warlord since Anakin was born. During their walk to the warehouse, Skywalker would ask Shalal why he wanted to join the Republic, to which he would learn why Shalal had such an interest in serving on behalf of the Republic. Anakin would learn why the Kaylee warrior believed in serving the Republic, and it would be a way to inspire him about his own mission as a Jedi General during this war. While General Shalal was very interested in joining the war effort, he figured that the best way to be of help was to be patient and let young Skywalker train his student before they got around to getting him up into the Republic High Command structure. When they arrived at the warehouse, Ahsoka was just landing. She looked over at General Shalal and noticed that he was someone that she'd never seen before. Anakin called Snips over to the center of the warehouse and told her what she would be doing telling her the importance of the exercise. As General Shalal watched the young Jedi begin her training, he was very impressed, not just with her abilities, but with Skywalker's training techniques. While Shalal wasn't familiar with the tactics of training a Jedi, he did realize that this was a more unorthodox method based on the reaction that Ahsoka gave for being trained in this fashion. When Ahsoka was eventually shot by Clone Trooper Jesse, Skywalker and Shalal would talk about everything they would do once Ahsoka was finished training. Truthfully, Anakin knew a lot about Shalal and wanted to make sure he got the most usefulness out of his service to the Republic. Anakin was shooting for Shalal to be able to command at least a legion of clone trippers, but even Skywalker knew that was a long shot, though he believed it was entirely within the realm of possibilities. Anakin trusted that the Republic would want a strong-minded citizen to stand up for what was right. Anakin and Quimen discussed everything. For Anakin, he wanted to know what size of an army and fleet the general would like to serve with. Shalal knew that the Republic forces were limited, and he wanted to be sure that it was a chance for others to lead, and so he realized that, because he was late to the war, he might have to wait to get an army of his own. Anakin respected Shalal's humility and understanding, even knowing that he might have struggles with getting any number of troops under his belt, let alone a legion. After a couple of hours of Ahsoka's training, Anakin would have Ahsoka return to the Jedi Temple so that she could get some rest. Anakin and Shalal would go up to Anakin's capital ship to have a talk with Admiral Yularen, considering he was someone who went through the Republic ranks to reach his level. Yularen told Skywalker that there was actually a new group of clone troopers coming off of Kamino, and they would likely be perfect of a fit for Shalal. Yularen also knew about General Shalal and all of his successes and believed that the Republic military would have no issue with Shalal taking over control of a group of clone troopers and leading them into battle. Which inevitably, for General Shalal, he would be welcomed into the Grand Army of the Republic as a general. Though his role as general only had him leading an army of around 3,000 clone troopers, he was fulfilled with the role he played though. Being that Skywalker commanded an elite unit of clone troopers, General Shalal wanted to make sure that his men were elite by all means. The clones were great troopers, and their training was more than exceptional, but for a warlord who worked with individuals who weren't bred to fight for 10 years, he had tips and tricks that he would assist the clones in the long run with. So when Shalal was gifted his army and a small fleet that could transport them, he began his training regiment for the clone troopers. Shalal wanted the clones to accept him as one of their own, because he would be leading them into combat throughout the war. He didn't want them to see him as a general who would stand there and let them die for him. He was there with them, to serve with them, to fight with them, and to die with them. The clones at first found this a bit annoying, but as time went on they respected their general a lot more. There was one more thing that was gifted to General Shalal before he departed for the battlefront. The Jedi decided that the best gift for the warrior would be a set of weapons that would aid him in battle. While traditionally the Jedi wouldn't just hand out a set of lightsabers, they believed a warrior like Shalal should be equipped to fight battle droids. It would make him a fine duelist if he encountered a Sith Lord, and it would keep him relatively safe on the battlefront. It was per request of Anakin Skywalker, and the Jedi High Council believed that Anakin was right with his request, being that Shalal was a powerful warrior who garnered the respect of the Jedi Council. With everything set in place, nearly six months into the war, General Shalal would lead his group of clones across the galaxy. General Shalal would be outfitted with a fleet of two Venators and a small number of support ships. 
It would work perfectly for Shalal because he wasn't a traditional warrior. He was nearly undefeated in all of his time as a warlord and his strategy would be much different from a typical Jedi and clone strategy. Shalal's clone lieutenant found Shalal's tactics to be unorthodox, at least compared to the strategy that many of his brothers had encountered on their own respective missions with the Jedi generals. Though once General Shalal took to the battlefront, he and his men became instant victors. Without someone with the tactical genius and total resolve that a strategist like Shalal, the Separatists would begin to struggle. The thing about Shalal is he had a tendency to make 3,000 men feel like 30,000 men. He utilized every trooper to make sure they fit in the best position to avoid any tragic downfalls. As for fleet combat, Shalal's fleet was able to beat back fleets much larger than his own. This garnered the Kaylee General reputation and a titled nickname, Hero of the Rim. His group of clone troopers were referred to as the Saviors, because every time General Shalana's men entered combat, they showed no mercy to the droid forces, but they also saved the lives of millions through their quick work. This pushed Shalal into a higher ranking position within the Republic military, and not many months after joining the Republic and serving cooperative missions alongside his two now favored Jedi, Anakin Skywalker and Obi-Wan Kenobi, he was gifted more men and a much larger fleet. General Shalal's army jumped from around 2,500, including the losses of recent battles, to 15,000. The fleet he was given had five Venators and even more support ships. Palpatine began to see promise in this new warrior. Dooku did too, and because of Shalal's success, he put a target on his back. There were several individuals who saw him as a threat, and the Separatists were consistently gunning for him. But with the Separatists not having someone like General Grievous on their side, Jedi were able to find more victories than losses, especially because Asajj Ventress was the main opponent and Dooku was hardly ever seen unless he was scrutinizing with Skywalker. Regardless, Shalil's tactics won him the attention of the galactic media. Anakin Skywalker, Ahsoka Tano, Obi-Wan Kenobi, and General Shalal were headliners across the Republic as heroes of the Republic. They often served together, but when they weren't together, they were individually carving up the Separatists. With Shalal on the side of the Republic, the Separatists couldn't really afford to fake lose their war effort, because he was gunning for their capital. Though Palpatine pulled Shalal away from Raxus midway through the war so they could help lead an invasion on Genosis, which was fine, but to Shalal he saw this as almost failure to try and accomplish victory. Not saying that Shalal would have easily captured the planet, but he saw this as a very weird choice by the Chancellor especially since Anakin, Obi-Wan, Luminar Unduli, and Kiari Mundi were scheduled to lead the assault on Genosis. It's not like the Jedi needed a fifth army to capture the planet, especially because with Grievous present, the siege itself only took a matter of a day and a half. When Shalal returned to the front near Raxus, the Separatists ramped up their forces to an extreme. Several of the largest ships in the Separatist fleet were stationed outside of Raxus. Shalal thought this would be weird mostly because he found a back route into Raxus when he was pulled away from combat. It couldn't have been a coincidence, but the Separatists, as far as he knew, didn't know he was there. So them setting up a counter fleet in the back route to Raxus was rather odd. Shalal noticed other coincidences during the war regarding Skywalker's involvement with battles. From time to time, Skywalker would be pulled away from the battlefront to be with the Chancellor. Those battles tended to become the bloodiest battles of the Clone Wars for the 501st. It's not that they couldn't manage without Skywalker, but it was a fact it was a battle itself. How entrenched the Separatists became during the battle, and how the chances of Skywalker being killed during those combative pieces were much larger than normal. Shalal also paid great attention to the political moves of the Galactic Republic, because midway during the war, the Republic and the Separatists almost came to peace, when the power grid of Coruscant was bombed. While Shalal was filling out his mandate to the Republic, he couldn't help but notice that something larger was at play here. He began to document the coincidences, and he kept them locked in a private file that he shared with his clone lieutenant. The clone lieutenant didn't look at the files, he just knew that he had access to them if he wanted them. Though from time to time, Shalal would talk to Skywalker and Kenobi about these coincidences, a lot of the time bringing up the fact that Skywalker was leaving the battlefront per request of the Chancellor on the worst battles. Kenobi had noticed this, but he didn't say anything until Shalal brought it up to him. Though he made a point to tell Shalal that Anakin and the Chancellor were good friends, and it could have been the reason as to why he was being pulled from combat. Though the fact that the Chancellor pulled Shalal from Raxus for the Battle of Genosis was a bit odd in Kenobi's opinion. Kenobi made a point to address his concerns to the High Council. Shalal was in the middle ground, and he couldn't tell if he trusted the Republic or the Jedi more, because the Jedi served with him on the front lines, while the Republic seemingly didn't do anything to stop the war. Yes, the Chorus on electrical grid issue, but other than that, there were no other attempts to make peace with the Separatists. 
Regardless, Jalal's tactics worked to perfection. He knocked out every foe he came across. This mostly is because Jalal had been saving all of his strategies and perfecting them for the last 20 years, without being a warlord before the Clone Wars. Though there was one opponent that returned from the Shadow Realm and was beginning to cause troubles across the battlefront. His name was Admiral Trench. He was reported killed at the Battle of Christophsis, but that obviously wasn't the case, being that his flagship was seen ripping through a Republic fleet in the mid-rim. General Shalal told the Republic that he would like permission to chase him down, but if he was given permission, he would need additional reinforcements to do so. Shalal's request was fulfilled when Captain Tarkin and a fleet of three more Venators mounted up with him. Another group of reinforcements were gifted to General Shalal from a victorious fleet in the mid-rim. The Jedi General with the group mounted up with the General and Captain as they began discussing how they would chase down, attack, and defeat Trench. Admiral Trench was a tactical genius, and he knew how to play the game of cat and mouse. It was all about drawing the enemy in and forcing them to play on your side of the board. Admiral Trench and General Shalal knew that. Captain Tarkin wasn't exactly a tactical genius, and suggested that they jump straight in and smash Trench's fleet. But the Jedi General, Sacy Tin, completely disagreed with that notion. It would only cost the Republic their forces, and they couldn't afford to do that. The Republic had to be gentle, and they had to attack relentlessly and smart. General Shalal told the Jedi and the Captain that they would arrive in three separate fleets. Shalal believed that he could get the trench to bite the target, and then they would jump in with reinforcements. Considering their fleet consisted of 12 Venators and several support ships, Shalal gave his instructions for the plan. Master Tin and Captain Tarkin believed it would work, and so, they all jumped on the train with General Shalal. They all departed for their individual capital ships, and then they prepared to take down one of the largest threats in the Clone Wars. General Shalal would have to take an individual Venator. It was not his actual capital ship, but he arrived at a hyperspace. He did this for the sole reason of drawing Trench in. Shalal would lead an attack, arriving in a singular Venator with two Arquentances around him. To Trench it appeared as if a scout fleet entered the wrong system. From there, Shalal would have to have his fleet put its full shields on to hold out while Trench and the rest of his fleet surrounded the smaller Republic fleet. When it all seemed lost, Captain Tarkin and five Venators would arrive at a hyperspace from the left flank, as Stacey Tin with six other Venators would arrive from the other side of the flank. Admiral Trench would be caught in a crossfire, and with the battle in full effect, all the fighters would launch from General Shalal's ship and go into full offense. He would direct the fleet into combat and position everyone as he saw it fit in his mind's eye. Everything played out perfectly for General Shalal. Admiral Trench was completely blindsided and his support ships began to suffer, crumbling under the heavy attack. As Admiral Trench tried to make a last ditch escape, his hyperdrive was crushed by the firepower of the Republic fleet, though the battle wouldn't be so easily won, as a reinforcement fleet that was meant to meet up with Admiral Trench here arrived out of hyperspace. General Shalal saw this and realized that, while they may have claimed a victory over Trench, this would be more than they could handle. Shalal called out reinforcements from the closest Republic fleets in the area, as he repositioned the present fleet to defend itself. Shalal knew that he could use the smaller support ships to eat up more of the damage, and so he directed the smaller support ships to protect the Venators, and have the fighters reposition themselves behind Stacey Tin, who was leading the air assault. When the new Separatist fleet arrived, they released all their fighters and began battle. It was immediately intense, and the Republic was caught completely off guard. Three Lucre Hawks were bad enough alone, just because of the amount of fighters they could release, but there was also a number of support ships in this fleet that could very easily go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Republic Venator. The battle went from a rout to a stalemate very quickly. Though Shalal knew what the best approach would be to take out the capital ships, it would be a risk, but sending in a Republic fighters to take out the Lucre Hulk might be worth a shot, and so Stacey Tin led a group of fighters towards the Lucre Hulk. As they got close, they ran a bombing run along the exterior of the ship towards the center and it landed a direct hit. With one Luger Hawk down, the battle already looked a little bit more sustainable, though the Republic fleet was taking hits. Shalal watched as a Venator crumbled nearby. Tension rose, as he asked where the reinforcements were. His lieutenant called out that there were no reinforcements able to get to them. Shalal took a deep breath. He realized that he would have to pull a daring move to accomplish a victory here. He analyzed the Separatist fleet as a ship rocked back and forth. It was already heavily damaged because it was the first ship hit when it arrived from hyperspace. Shalal ran over to the hollow table, requesting the lieutenant to pull out the battle map. When he did, he analyzed the Separatist fleet, as one of the deckhands called out telling him that the shields were down to 24% power. They couldn't handle much more. Not long after the deckhand called that out, a support ship nearby Shalal's ship exploded, causing the ripple effect as debris crashed into the sides of the vessel. Shalal figured it out. 
he whipped around demanding the fleet to turn to the port side and begin to encircle the Separatist fleet. Tarkin asked what he was doing, to which Shalal told him that he was winning this battle. As the fleet moved into position, it allowed the entire Republic fleet to move into broadsiding position against the Separatist fleet, while also nullifying the effectiveness of the rest of the fleet. This would put pressure on exactly half of the Separatist fleet and allow the Republic to cut down on the numbers of Separatist forces while also keeping the fleet defended. This move would push the Republic to win an overwhelming victory over the Separatists. In this moment, General Shalal realized they had a pathway to Raxus. While Tarkin seemed a bit iffy on it, Sacy Tin believed that Shalal had the right idea. Especially because not long after the battle, General Kenobi told Shalal that he could be wherever he needed him to be after having cleaned up a battle over another midway world. So General Shalal, without permission from the Republic High Command, decided that he would take a daring attack on the capital planet of the Separatists. Shalal knew that disobeying Republic High Command could get him in serious trouble, but he, as a warrior, cared about two things, victory and the lives of the men that he served with. And with a victory, he could save more men from this bloody war. It was still only the second year of combat, and Shalal believed that this could end the war right here and right now. Especially with the assistance of Generals Tin and Kenobi, they could very easily lead a campaign on the ground. While Tarkin was a Palpatine loyalist, he saw a potential Republic victory here, something he believed would earn him favorability with the Chancellor. Within the span of five hours, the Republic would concoct a plan that would allow them to conquer Raxus and put an end to the war. The Jedi Council was informed of this. While at this point they hadn't decided that Palpatine was an enemy of the state, they would be wary of what he did in the coming hours, days, and weeks of a Republic victory over Raxus. The reason the defeat of Admiral Trench was so important was because the fleet he was grouping up with was the defense fleet over Raxus. He was meant to be taking the former defense fleet from Raxus and moving towards Ringo Vinda, while another fleet filled its place. The Separatists hadn't noticed how close the Republic got to Raxus, and so they were taking their time with moving the fleets around. Regardless, the orders were set, and the fleet jumped to hyperspace. It was one of, if not, the largest show of strength by the Republic in the entire Clone Wars. And when the Republic arrived out of Raxus, they caught the Separatists completely off guard. There was a very small defense fleet and it was quickly dealt with by Sacy Tin and his fighter squadrons. Master Tin told Shalal and Kenobi that the ground invasion would be open, and so, as the word was said, the Republic descended into the capital world of the Separatists. The droids were completely caught off guard, but truthfully, the galaxy was caught off guard. According to Palpatine's propaganda, the war was so far out of Republic control, he needed more emergency power from the Senate. Now with the Republic stampeding across the capital world of the Separatists, the Senate would lose their trust in Palpatine. The Siege of Raxus wouldn't take long. Kenobi and Shalal, being the good friends they were, were able to march down the streets of Raxus with little resistance and claim victory. Now it's not that the droids didn't defend Raxus, they definitely did. It was just a matter of they didn't have the defenses really prepared, because there was no reason to have the defenses prepared for a fight. Raxus was perfectly safe for the entire war. The Republic, according to the Republic and according to Dooku, were too far away to even levy an assault on Raxus, which is why the switch was such a crucial junction in the war. With the Republic claiming a crucial victory of the homeworld of the Separatists, the Separatists were forced to surrender. While yes, they had the ability to continue the war, the Separatist Council saw that their failure had finally come to a close. They would negotiate the terms of surrender. While the Republic would be victorious, there would be drama inside the Senate. The biggest issue, not being the terms of surrender, but the fact that the Chancellor was levying propaganda on the people of the galaxy to get himself more power in the Senate, which ended up working out for him. So the Senate was on the verge of forcing Palpatine from power. They really had no issue with it, because truthfully, it would be better to have the Chancellor that didn't want to prolong a war for power, in power during these times of peace. Plus, getting rid of Palpatine would likely mean the Separatists would take a smaller deal. And so, a day after a victory on Raxus, Chancellor Palpatine would be voted out of power in a vote of no confidence, and in his place would rise a senator from Pandora. She was a rising star in the ranks of the Republic, and while her views weren't always backed by everyone, she had a strong assertive voice that could appeal to both sides of the aisle, especially as someone to speak for the Republic in this crucial time. Her name was Senator Ryo Chushi. She threw her name into the hat and didn't expect to be pulled, but she was the main choice between the other senator who represented the banking clans. And the truth is, the Republic didn't really quite trust the banking clans with policy making, especially when it was discovered that they were sided with the Separatists. Though, when the peace treaty began, everything started to dissolve for the Separatists. While Palpatine, having been thrown out of office, retreated to Sereno, the Separatist alliance began breaking apart. In the middle, still a part of the alliance, was the Trade Federation. But the banking clans, Techno Union and Genosian Industries pulled out of it. 
All that remained were a few smaller groups and the Commerce Guild alongside the Trade Federation. This was a large issue, mainly for Palpatine, because while the war may have come to an end, he lost the majority of the forces he could wage war with. He was extremely dissatisfied with the outcome of this war, mostly because it heavily disfavored him, and he suffered because of it. With the ratification of the Treaty of Bothawai, the Republic and the CIS would join together in peace, uniting under one Republic. This also included the joining of the Neutral Systems Coalition to align itself with one government in the galaxy, which would inevitably lead Obi-Wan Kenobi being sent with the 212th to liberate Mandalore from the Death Watch and from Darth Maul. It would break treaties, but overall it would be a redemption tale for Kenobi, having lost the love of his life to Maul on Mandalore. Kenobi would defeat Maul, and the 212th would defeat the Death Watch, ending the rule of terror. With everything realigning for the forces of good in the galaxy, Palpatine and Dooku would begin their brainstorming of ideas of how they would defeat the Republic. The Trade Federation and Commerce Guild retreated into the depths of the galaxy. They stood tall, but when their allies ditched them, their confidence dropped to an all-time low. They no longer had the confidence to stand up to the will of the Republic. Mostly because, how could they? The Republic was united as one, and they had nothing to fight for. Their little rebellion was squashed, and that was simply it. The end of the war didn't just mean an automatic end to conflict, though. The Jedi were being sent out into the galaxy to track down and destroy the Sith. The end of the war came at a great time, because it stopped Jedi Padawan Barriss Ophi from bombing the Jedi Temple. This would keep Ahsoka Tano as Skywalker's student as the search for the Sith began. Though inside the Sith layers on Sereno, there was deceit brewing. While Sidious moved locations and went to hiding because of his public persona being destroyed, he was trying to recommence his plans for galactic domination. It was a going as far as he would have simply wanted it to go, because he had to start fresh. That is, until Sereno's air raid sirens began to ring. Of course, the Republic wasn't going to just bombard the planet Sereno, but the Jedi were here. Because after all, this was Dooku's homeworld and they were coming to capture him for being a war criminal. And, it being only a day and a half after the end of the war, the Jedi were coming to take Dooku out, because he remained a long-standing threat to the galaxy. The people of Serena were done with him anyways, so why would they care? As Sidious prepared to depart from the planet, he was filled with a great suffering. Dooku literally backed out his master because he wasn't going to play the long game anymore. Dooku was a political idealist at heart, and while he may have accidentally committed a few war crimes here and there, the only reason he ever joined Sidious was to take down the Republic, and now all that opportunity was gone. The Republic still stood, he lost everything he ever cared about, and he wasn't about to spend the rest of his life serving an ungrateful goblin who romanticized the future like it was perfectly scribed out by a greater power, guaranteeing that he would have control of the entire galaxy. All a falsehood now. And with the death of Sidious, Dooku retreated into the Outer Rim, barely escaping Anakin Skywalker and Ahsoka Tano as they came to Sereno looking for Dooku. The people of Sereno were so happy that Dooku was now gone. He'd been stealing from them for the duration of the last 13 years. While yes, he had generational wealth considering his last name was Sereno, he wasn't overly kind to the people here. Skywalker and Tana would find the recently deceased body of Palpatine, and in that moment they would realize that Palpatine was a Sith Lord, likely betrayed by Dooku. Ironic, isn't it? General Shilo would finish off his servitude to the Republic with a crushing victory over the last standing forces of the Separatists. The road would be bumpy, but the Republic itself would find peace. As would Skywalker, enjoying his secret beautiful life till the end of his, whereas General Shilo would return to his people and be hailed a hero just as he was by his friends and by the Republic. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our story. Again, special thanks to Benjamin Wells, Pimp Daddy Bane, Darth Cheesy, Apollo, Mad Manic Studios, Anakin Zeros 303, Lemon Knight, Flynn, Vincis, and Lord Deadwing for supporting the channel. Let's hit the other likes of the video. I know what's coming next, but it is. If you want to see a what if, let me know below. Or drop comments, don't do crossovers. Check out the Twitch community, this one. All the things are listed below as well. Um, let's talk about our story real quick, Aruni. Um, also, get ready for the miniseries. Miniseries coming out soon. I'm so psyched. I am just finishing up for it. There's actually a custom intro that I made uh, because I have a music degree, and so I figured I should use my music degree um, for something since I make YouTube videos. So uh, there's a custom intro being made for that right now. I'm very excited for that series, if you guys couldn't tell. Anyways, let's talk about our story here. This was fun. I had a lot of fun with this. So uh, initially, you have to kind of set it up, and I'm going to talk about the beginning of this, um, because you have to initially set it up for, you know, you have to set it up for General Grievous to want to join the Republic. And first things first, he needs to not be sabotaged by Dooku. Uh, that's like the main thing, at least in canon, I'm going by canon terms here, is like, like in canon, um, like the, when the Republic came to, um, to the homeworld of the Huck, they created a, like an issue with the Kaylee and it ended up making the Kaylee starve and like thousands of people died because of it. And so 
I wanted to reverse that situation, say the Jedi didn't mess it up like they always mess it up, and so with the Jedi not messing it up, Shalal uh, doesn't become General Grievous because he doesn't get involved with Sidious or Dooku because, you know, he kind of revert, he reverts from his way of warriors for 10 years and 10 years after that entire thing, um, the invasion of Naboo happens. And so he's been not technically a warlord for 10 years. And so he's not on Sidious's or Dugu's radar. And so that lets him become, you know, lets him be himself. And I think that one thing I wanted to, like, one thing I wanted to highlight is I think we undervalue, and I, I might be, I might just speak, might be speaking for myself here, but I think we undervalue like General Grievous's effectiveness in the Clone Wars. Like I know, I know George. Like I know, like Legends fans really don't like that George nerfed General Grievous compared to like the 2002 series. But like, speaking of General Grievous, like in the in the Clone Wars, like that dude, like seriously had like a big effect on things. Like I know we always see him like like the twirly mustache thing is what George specifically referred to him as like the twirly mustache villain. Um, but like I know we still always see Grievous like retreating from battle, but like. When he's not retreating from battle, he's winning. And this dude like wins all the time. Like he would just casually show up on a Jedi like a Jedi council member's bridge and just take it like he would just take it from them. Like it wasn't a Jedi master or a Jedi council member. And the only one he really struggled with was Kit Fisto and Obi-Wan Kenobi. And so seeing that effect kind of turn against the separatists is like the separatists kind of lose somebody that has that much power. And I think him as a warlord being able to use a superior fighting force and taking advantage of that would be really cool. And so I went with a little bit more of a tame Grievous here, a little bit more tame Shalal, because again, he hasn't been on the battlefront for like 20 years. So he's a little bit more down to earth. Uh, he's not like a psycho, like Pong Krell. He's kind of like, you know, he's kind of like having like, he's not like trying to kill his men. And that's something I want to highlight here is like, he's not actively trying to make his men die. And so that, that was kind of fun. I hope you all enjoyed this though. Uh, this was a fun video to do. Kind of kind of focusing on character that we don't really focus on a whole lot. And so I like these kind of videos, like the Django Fett video we did last week. A lot of fun. So anyways, I hope you all enjoyed. I love you all. Spread the love. And always remember, my friends, may the Force be with you.